Welcome, Twisted Creatures of the Fae. I'm your host, Lay McLeod Jackson, and devils refuse to take my soul on principle. In our last video, we met good old Ethel Sweet Tongue, an aged hag who has traveled the entire world coming up with new mystical means of torment and transformation. But old Ethel has decided it's time for a bit of a change, so she's returned to the old homestead, the hamlet Porous Hill, to begin the fiendish transformation of becoming a night hag. Ah! I love a reunion. But first, we need to determine how exactly she plans on accomplishing all of this, barring meddlesome do-goodery from your players. But first, it does no harm to spend a moment on the why. Why does Ethel want to make the change from Fade to Fiend? Because many of the usual tempters just don't apply to a hag. She is already virtually immortal, possesses great power and knowledge, and is already evil, with a great deal of independence. There is no simple answer for what causes a person to descend into darkness, and that's also true for an inherently cruel creature. But there are a couple of things that would give us a clue. One, Ethel's a traveler. She's not found a single swamp or rock or sea that she wants to live. She's tasted all of these lives, but still is unfulfilled. But the night hag has no home. She wanders the world looking for pure souls to corrupt and drag into majestic, if infernal, new realms. This appeals to Ethel. The other is Ethel's covetousness. Now, this is a future of all hags, but Ethel is a purist. The destruction of other people is all she lives for. Other hags may have various interests and prophecies, but she loves to destroy. And that's why she's returned to this particular town. She suffered some great failure here centuries ago, and she holds a grudge, so they will become the instrument to her ascension. But how? How does a hag go from one form to another, particularly when it's fey to fiend? I'll tell you this much, she's not making a deal with anyone. No siree, Bob. This is a dark ritual. Now, what goes into this corrupt manifestation of magic? Well, if we look at the Night Hag's items, we find two very special objects. It's probably not much of a stretch to assume these items are necessary components to their fiendish ascension. But I don't think these objects themselves are going to be enough to transform Ethel's sweet tongue into whatever comes next. A thing can be easy. But it's still going to be, in the words of my logician friends, a necessary condition. So how do we go about getting them. Let's go dive into some darkness. So let's start with the Night Hag's first accessory, something they've possessed since at least original D&D. A heartstone, which allows the Night Hag to switch between the ethereal and material realms, and, if touched by a player, can cure any disease. Which, if you think about it, is surprisingly benign. Like, this is a fiend, a creature of pure evil, and it's formed from an already malevolent fae, and its essential item does no damage and can actually help people. It cures diseases. Shame. Shame. But that seeming contradiction works really well for the theme we've constructed, particularly the character of Ethel. Ethel believes it is in the contrast of beauty and wickedness that the one can really come to life. Her sea hag has lovely eyes, her green hag a lovely voice. Whatever ingredients go into this heartstone, we already know she's inclined to put some ooey gooey goodness in there, just so everything else is all the worse. Now essentially, this is the item that our new Lady of the Night will use to jump between the realms. This means to me, in order to craft it, you have to have parts of both worlds. Items from the material plane to ground you. Energy from the ethereal plane to bring you into the void. Both of these will be bound with joy and love. I'll explain how the good material works in a second. Now, in the most recent edition, it tells us that it takes 30 days to craft a heartstone. I mean, cliche, but I'd like to make this a literal thing. Here's where I'm going with this. Here's where I'm going with this. The night hag corrupts the virtuous by turning them vile, right? A metaphorical way of saying that a person has gone from warm to cold or kind to ruthless is to say their heart has turned to its stone. I mean, I know you got it, but I can't help myself. It's stone. So let's make that metaphor literal. Ethel chooses a person, but not just anyone, a noble, kind, sweet human being and infects them with the first part of the concoction. This creates a focal point inside the creature's chest, centered in her heart. And every night, Ethel visits our sweet lady and feeds her magical ingredients to strengthen that brew. 
cup of tea infused with the remains of a ghost. The tears of a grateful mother dripped into her mouth. The earth from the tree of a dryad baked into some cookies. Some of these should be difficult for the hag to get. She might even enlist your players in the effort to achieve them. But as the spell strengthens, all happiness, kindness, laughter gets drained into that heart. The person no longer feels that warmth. Mary can't feel anything but wrath, viciousness, pride, lust. You know, my seven deadly sins. Until at the end of those 30 days, she's been drained of all decency and her heart has become a literal blackened stone. Which, of course, needs to be removed with impunity. The first step to becoming a night hag. The next item is a soul bag, which carries the essence of evil mortals. This changes the game. You see, up until now, Ethel might have enjoyed eliciting tragedy to destroy those people around her, but she didn't get anything out of it. Nothing material, at the least. She just did it for fun. It's a feature of her fey aesthetic and inclination, but with the soul bag, things get serious. She goes from amateur to pro. Use these souls in her own magics. Trade them to devils and demons for knowledge and power. Bind them to other minions at her will. Just a little side note, it says that only one soul can be stored in a bag at any one time, but it doesn't say how many bags she can have on her, so... The monster manual specifies that this heinous item must be made of humanoid skin in a process that takes seven days and be the result of a sacrifice. Surprising! No one. I mean, that's how I do it. I mean, don't pay attention to that. What it doesn't mention is, is the creature alive for a seven-day sacrificial process? There is nothing, and I mean nothing wrong by saying that there's some quick stabby ritual that goes down. Bang, 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 they're dead. Take the skin, spend seven days curing it, whatever, to get the bag. Nothing wrong with that, and you're probably less sick if you do it. Or you can be twisted in the head like me. This is an unquestionably evil item. It's a pouch made to hold the souls of only evil individuals, which means the victims of the sacrifice are going to have to be evil. Lured by the promises of riches, pleasure, or even pain, these human monsters are lured by the hag and then strung up with dark writing on their flesh and over a seven-day period are drained of all their life while the flesh falls from their bones. So here's why I'm doing this nonsense. One, it gives you a group of people to rescue. Now, you may ask, oh, do you rescue the evil people? Of course you do. That is a ridiculous, painful way to die. You can still arrest them afterwards, and they can provide you with information. They are not going to want to defend the hag. Two, it's indicative of alter self, which is something the night hag can do that all the other hags don't. They do illusions. She actually transforms. Three, if the stone takes 30 days, and each of these take a week to make, well, theoretically, she could have four soul bags by the time she's ready. One for each of your players, perhaps? So now that we have the two items of power, what comes next? What is the ritual that turns a fae into a fiend? Imagine the first step is cutting herself off from the material plane, and in particular, the fae wild. Involve bringing a cauldron of course it involves a cauldron, up to a boiling temperature and throwing in creatures of the fey, pixies, sprites, and at least one medium-sized creature, like a satyr or a blink dog or a dryad. Once the concoction is ready and all of these poor creatures have boiled into the potion, she lathers some up and pours it inside the soul bag, tying it up and shaking it. Then consume that soul bag along with pieces of other evil outsiders that she's chopped up. Inside her belly, that creature becomes a larva and it starts to eat her from the inside out, consuming every part of her connected to the fey wild, multiplying, growing until there's hundreds of them, thousands of them, consuming her from the inside out. Flesh bone and sinew are consumed and replaced with a new material, a new fiendish body. Infused with an evil outsider's power, a new mutable body, and the tools necessary to turn even the most virtuous into vile monsters, she can go wreck havoc on a wider scale.
But she did pick this town for a reason, and hags can't sort of help their own malevolence. They're just like any other fae that way. So, while she's in town, she may also haunt the descendant of an old foe, drown a few random passerbys in the river, push what would have been a happy marriage into chaos through lies and deceit, frame an innocent man for a crime he didn't commit while helping the guilty party skedaddle, and, of course, she could sell some cursed items to some wandering heroes. That still doesn't answer why here. Why has she chosen Porous Hill to make the transformation? Ethel, no matter what else she wants to be, is still fundamentally a hag. She has a long memory, and she holds bitter grudges. She's here because this place is important to an old enemy, and she will see it burn before she's done. Enemy will call Thea Galendo. Now, Thea was an elf wizard who was left here by her family long ago. Centuries ago, she and her high elf family came to this town at a time of momentous change. Ethel had probably been here for millennia, doing what green hags do, drowning youths, making deals with foolish mortals, dancing up a storm on a Saturday night. You know, typical hag things. And there came the birth of someone remarkable, the kind of opportunity that's once in a lifetime, even for an immortal fey creature. A human girl born with magic coursing through her veins, a sorceress of untapped power. But not just any power, a violent, uncontrollable surge that destined her for greatness. Ethel thought she had found a new purpose, an opportunity to corrupt someone who would affect the entire realm for the worse. And whenever Ethel could risk it, she spent time with the girl, feeding her selfishness, feeding her anger. But then one day, when the girl was maybe eight or nine, Thea and her family arrived in the village. They immediately saw the girl's potential, but also the darkness that had touched her souls. The rest of the elves decided that it was best to get out of Dodge now before this kid grew up to be the most destructive force the world had ever seen. But Thea said no. No child deserves to be abandoned, particularly when they need help the most. So Thea decided to stay and see if she could guide her to a better path. A battle for the girl's soul began, but Thea, with patience and power, managed to drive away the hag and help raise her to become a hero. That girl grew up to be Ferris Stormbringer, a hero to the people of that town and the entire country. The kind of hero that exists only once in ten lifetimes. She died a force of good, surrounded by a happy, loving family. Ethel will never forgive Thea. Thea and Ethel had fought over the soul, and Ethel lost. She had been forced to leave the bog she loved and travel the world to discover new secrets, never to return, or so Thea thought. Thea still lives in Porous Hollow, but even by elven standards, she's come to the end of her very long life. Almost 800 years old and beginning to lose her faculties, she can't tell that Ethel's influence is beginning to creep back in to the village she loves so much. Maybe she never will. Or maybe your heroes will get her help. At any rate, the feud is not over, and before she becomes a night hag, Ethel is determined to pay back her old foe. Unless your heroes get in the way. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Again, this is Lane McLeod Jackson, hoping you'll break legs and your players' hearts.